from Celestia's perspective, um, like one of the most important parts of a blockchain, or one of the reasons, the whole point of a blockchain is that end users can kind of efficiently verify the state of the chain. How you personally or the Celestia ecosystem uh, views decentralization, uh, because I think that's one thing that's hard in the industry for everybody to agree upon. I think like there's two main areas of decentralization for the, for on layer one itself. The first area is de decentralizing block production, making sure there's a diverse range of kind of block producers. And the reason why you need that is for censorship resistance. The second part of decentralization, I would argue, argue potentially even more important, which is this idea of decentralizing block verification. I really do think you guys have pushed the space and you specifically have pushed the space forward on like clients and really opened the eyes of the industry, I think, to what are possible with them. Today, I'm joined by Mustafa, uh, one of the co-founders of Celestia. Uh, they're truly pioneers in the space on light clients. Uh, Mustafa has put out quite a few papers, uh, deep technical papers about blockchain in the entire industry. Uh, and they're building really one of the high throughput kind of modular uh, tech stacks. And so I think this is going to be a fabulous conversation and really appreciate you joining me on the podcast, Mustafa. Yeah, thanks for having me here. Looking forward to it. Perfect. Perfect. Well, uh, I'm, I'm excited to kick it off and maybe we can just jump right into things. Um, on a high level, I mean, could you just kind of explain a little bit about Celestia's vision, kind of what is the end goal and how you see kind of blockchains kind of ending up? Sure. So the kind of general idea of Celestia is to kind of really take a look at blockchain architecture and to kind of strip back the core components of a blockchain and to basically create a very simple layer one that only does the core functions that a layer one needs to do for other people to build on top of it. Like Celestia was originally called Lazy Ledger. And the reason for that was because it's basically a very lazy layer one. It only does the core things that a layer one needs to do. And those, those are consensus and data availability. So like Celestia doesn't have any smart contract platform. It doesn't have any execution environment for users to build applications on top. Instead, P developers are expected to deploy their own execution environments on top of Celestia in the form of roll-up chains. And so Celestia is basically a very simple layer one that's optimized to data availability and consensus to allow roll-up chain developers to build scalable rollups on top of a scalable DA. And that's Celestia. Perfect. Uh, at like what point in time did you realize like kind of separating these stacks was the appropriate way to go? And for me personally, it also took me a little bit of time to learn like how data availability work. You've put out a lot of great papers on this. Could you explain, I mean, maybe to start out with like what data availability is, uh, why it kind of needs to be increasing and then how over time your kind of views change on kind of the modular stack. Yeah, sure. Um, so it, at first, it's not really obvious why blockchains need data availability, but I guess I can take a shot of explaining why. So you can imagine like, it, it, take Bitcoin, for example. If you imagine a version of Bitcoin, Let's take Bitcoin and let's say, what is, the, what is the most simple version of Bitcoin we can create? In the sense, like, how can we simplify the Bitcoin layer one as much as possible and push as many, as much task as possible to the end user or to the end node rather than the validator is doing all those tasks? And so what you get is you can kind of create a version of Bitcoin where you can actually be allowed to publish invalid transactions onto the chain. So like imagine a version of Bitcoin where like you can double spend and the, the, if, you, if, you, if there's two transactions that are double spending the same coins, they're actually published on the chain. So you might think, well, how can that be secure? Well, it's completely secure if you have an end user like protocol rule where the end users simply ignore those invalid transactions. And it turns out that in order to have double spend resistance, all you need is two things. You need ordering, you need to know what the order the transactions were published in so that you know which transactions came first. And secondly, you need to know the complete set of possible transactions that spent a specific, a specific 
coin or a specific uh, balance from an account. Because you need to, because in order to know which transaction came first, you need to know what all the transactions are. And knowing what all those transactions are is basically data availability. You, you need to know, you need to make sure that the transactions were published in the first place. And so that's kind of like a very like basic conceptual um, like reason why data availability is important in, in theory, but in more in practice, if you look at like um, kind of modern scaling solutions like rollups, they need data availability as well uh, because fraud proofs and zk fraud proofs need data availability to, to prove fraud, and zk rollups need data availability so that users can recompute the state of the chain. And so, because data availability is kind of like a central component to these modern scaling solutions, that's why we've um, kind of like decided to build a scalable data layer. But interestingly, lazy, the idea of lazy ledger came about before optimistic rollups. Like originally, the kind of like applica the application model in Celestia or lazy ledger wasn't based on rollups. It was just based on Kind of like what I would describe as like a pessimistic rollup that didn't even have fraud or zk proofs. But then when rollups came around and kind of rollups started becoming more popular, um, everything kind of clicked, clicked into place, and this idea of a modular stack kind of really um, made a lot of sense, where you can have you have data availability layer at the bottom of the stack, and then you can have you can build an execution environment on top of that data availability layer using using a rollup. It makes sense. So maybe just to summarize for the non-technical audience, I mean, ultimately, the end state, as you observed, and bef even before uh, uh, fraud proofs came online, or um, before prod proofs came online, you were kind of researching this and how to scale the data availability layer. So the base layer, uh, because whether it's a zero knowledge kind of rollup or a fraud proof rollup, both of those ultimately have to settle back down to the layer one uh, and consume kind of block space. Uh, you were thinking about how to scale uh, the base layer blockchain with more data to ultimately process more transactions. And then how did you start realizing at the end of the day, like the separation of execution was really the path forward and kind of, in your point of view, where the space needed to go? Yeah, so I think um, the way I kind of came to realize that is by kind of looking at the evolution of the blockchain stack and comparing it also to how Web2 evolved. So like if you look at before Ethereum, we had Bitcoin and we also had other chains like Namecoin or Litecoin. And it was basically like you had to, like Bitcoin was a blockchain for only one application, which was like the cryptocurrency application or like sound money. But at the time, if you wanted to create another application, you had to create your own chain. And, you know, like Ethereum didn't exist. And the, and the problem that Ethereum solved is a problem that, that you had to create your own chain every time you want to deploy a new application. And Ethereum solved that by having introducing the, this this world computer model, where like every chain can share or every application can share share the same chain, by having a general purpose smart contract platform. But then, but obviously that has scalability issues, and the reason for that is because, like, it, it just doesn't scale if you want to run the same application on the same computer. Like there is like, a world computer is inherently not scalable. And so that's what, and then that's where like um, systems like Cosmos and Polkadot came into play. So Cosmos, for example, the Cosmos vision was like instead of having a shared smart contract environment where everyone deploys their own contract, why don't we make it very easy um, for people to create their own layer one chains? And by providing this Cosmos SDK and Tendermint software, people can create their own chains. And instead of having to share the same chain, you can have create your own chain with its own resources. And those chains can kind of interoperate using IBC. So Celestia is kind of really the marriage of those two visions. Where because whereas whereas Ethereum um, it has shared security, but it all doesn't necessarily have scale because you have to share the same execution environment. And whereas um, Cosmos had kind of scale in the sense that 
you can create your own layer one chain with, with its own resources, but it didn't have shared security. And the rollups really kind of like, um, kind of like marry the two visions in some way, because you can have you can now have you can now have rollup chains as application specific chains, but they can now share security. And the idea of Celestia was to the original idea of Celestia was like what can what can, what if we kind of like took the vision of allowing anyone to create their own chain, but get, but gave those chains shared security. Um, by having like, like these lots of application specific chains, and what if we um, kind of created a layer one chain that was solely optimized for only one function, which is data availability and shared security, which at the time no one was building. Yeah, I, I think I mean, Celestia has really been a pioneer in kind of pushing the space forward on the data availability front and like clients, uh, very ahead of the game in both regards. I think. Uh, so and one thing you mentioned was the shared security and how important that is. And I, I think, as you mentioned, with the Cosmos ecosystem, there I think the upper bound, uh, the Cosmos hub is kind of limited to like, I think 175 or almost 200 kind of full nodes. Uh, and then each Cosmos zone or even like in the Avalanche kind of um, subnets, they kind of have to spin up their kind of own security, which definitely can be a drawback in that shared security model uh uh, really makes it easier to spin up uh, new execution environments, as you say. And m maybe like, I, I would also, uh, I really loved your talk with uh, Anatoly at the Celestia Summit, kind of uh, talking about ultimately Celestia versus Solana and kind of the different kind of nuances there. And I, if I maybe summarize, and please correct me if I'm wrong, a lot of it kind of just boils down to the cost of hardware per nodes. Could you maybe talk a little bit more on why you don't think or why you do not believe a single layer one can, can scale uh, kind of on a monolithic chain? Is it purely in your point of view, the data availability or is it the execution environment itself? Um, I mean, there's several elements to it. So from my perspective and from Celestia's perspective, um, like one of the most important parts of a blockchain, or one of the reasons, the whole point of a blockchain is that end users can kind of efficiently verify the state of the chain. Like the fact that, for example, like what makes, what, the fact, what makes Bitcoin interesting is not just that you have a decentralized set of miners and block producers. It's also that people can run full nodes so that they don't have to trust the miners to be um, honest to not steal the money or not to violate the monetary policy of the chain. The only thing they have to trust the miners for is not for safety, but for liveness and censorship resistance. And that's a very important part of the kind of like blockchain um, kind of like security model. But um, the, 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 the kind of like thinking behind Solana or like one of the, one of the problem, one of the current problems of Solana is that there's extremely high like full node resource requirements to for end users to verify the chain and the, the the decentralization story of solana kind of like very much revolves around this idea of having um, a decentralized set of values which is good but that's like very different threat model to bitcoin and ethereum where you don't even have to where you don't even need to trust the validators um for safety in in, in the first place and so with last year one of the one of the things that we were really trying to optimize is to to make sure that users are actually first class citizens of the network by having light light, light nodes that are trust minimized, and that's one of the kind of things that data availability sampling enables. It enables users to kind of verify the data availability availability of the chain without having to have the same resource requirements as a full node that has downloaded the entire chain. Yeah, I uh, I yeah the. Trust minimization with the light clients. I, again, I, I think you guys were much further ahead here in kind of in terms of uh, other ecosystems, including Solana. In terms of, I mean, just going back to like the specific question: Is it the execution environment, or is it the data availability? Do you think that the monolithic chains are just going to have a harder time scaling long term, or is it just that hardware costs just become increasingly high? So I, I think I think there's several elements to it. So so the, the question to me is um, like, well, in theory you could have like in theory you could have like a monolithic layer one chain with 
like fraud proofs, for example, and that could enable trust minimized light clients. But like one of the issues there is that um, if you want, like you will need more, you will need constantly more and more expensive uh, like nodes to generate those fraud proofs. Like if you want to participate in generating these fraud proofs, these fraud proofs, that you will need to, that you will need to run a full node to generate these fraud proofs, and the cost of running a full node is, becomes more and more expensive. So like, and so that's one of the like the scaling challenges of um, like having everything on a single chain. Whereas like if mm -hmm. you shard the state into multiple chains, then you're basically you're 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 allowing like you're, you're saying that full nodes can you can you can be a full node of only a specific shard. And then, then you need less resource requirements to participate in the security of the network. And so that's inherently more scalable. But rollups are basically like sharding, except that anyone can kind of, kind of create a shard. Like if you look at the history of rollups, it's like it kind of like went on the back of, um, from, from the Ethereum perspective, for example, Ethereum dropped execution sharding in favor of rollups because they basically kind of achieved the same, a, similar, a similar thing to sharding, except in a much more simple way. Yeah, yeah. No, it, it, it does make a lot of sense. I think maybe uh, I always say like, I think kind of in a comical sense, uh, a lot of these kind of nuances ultimately kind of boil down to like full nodes and like the cost to roll, run full nodes. And I, I definitely understand Celestia's perspective of making sure that everybody is treated equally. Maybe diving a little bit deeper into like how you personally or the Celestia ecosystem uh, views decentralization uh, because I think that's one thing that's hard in the industry for everybody to agree upon. Um, and so I always love to ask guests like, what is your specific view on like decentralization uh, of Celestia itself between like full nodes, like clients? Um, how do you view it all? Yeah, I mean, I think like from a, I think there's like several elements to decentralization. I think like if you're talking about purely from a from a sense of a layer one chain, like for purely layer one, uh, and there's other layers we can talk about, like layer zero, which is the social consensus layer. But let's talk about layer one for for now. I think like there's two main areas of decentralization for for on layer one itself. The first area is de decentralizing block production, like making sure there's a diverse range of um, kind of block producers. And the reason why you need that is for censorship resistance. And um, in general, like what, from what we've seen historically, there's only so far you can go. Like no chain, as far as I can tell, or no major chain, as far as, in, as I can tell, has had like a Nakamoto co coefficient of more than like 50, which means like you need 50, you need like, um, you don't need more than 50 validators to do a 51% attack on the chain or two thirds kind of majority attack on the chain. So like even though like chains like you know Ethereum or even Solana have tried to support this idea of having hundreds or thousands of validators, in practice, kind of like the power distributes to a few validators, and that's and and um, you can kind of get you can kind of like help get around that a little bit by enabling um, kind of like a very decentralized token distribution to make sure there's a wide range of stakers um, that can delegate to different validators. But that's but. That's um, where we go to the second part of decentralization, which is also, I would arguably argue, potentially even more important, which is this idea of decentralization, decentralizing block verification. And what do we mean by decentralizing block verification? So is this idea that even if the validators are malicious, they should not be able to do any safety violations. And by safety violations, I mean they should they should not be able to um, add invalid transactions to the chain, like steal people's money or print money out of thin air or anything like that. And that's, and with block verification, ideally end users, and that might include like, you know, exchanges or merchants or businesses, or even like normal people running a wallet, ideally should be able to kind of like have some, um, safety assurances about this, the state of the chain and verify that the validators have not in added any invalid transactions to the chain. And to achieve kind of like this, to achieve block verification, you need trust minimized light clients, or you need to make sure that block size is not so high 
that it's too expensive to run a full node. Yeah. And then finally, yeah, I would say uh, like from a, there's also layer zero decentralization, which is this idea of having a kind of like a decentralized um, social consensus layer. So it's like no one can arbitrarily add unfavorable kind of like changes to the uh, kind of protocol rules, for example. No, each of those uh, make a lot of sense. Yeah, I, I do think it's interesting. Uh, I mean, all chains, as you mentioned, or a majority of them, uh, still have relatively small Nakamoto coefficients for that, like one third stake weight uh, to start censoring transactions. And I, I feel like that's almost a social problem as well as how do you uh, get validators to also move their stake to uh, prevent some of that. Um, on So light clients, um, yeah, light clients are super interesting as well and definitely want to dive deeper into those a little bit down the podcast. But I think Celestia is unique or, uh, in its approach. I mean, you can, in my point of view, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, can kind of like put it into two buckets for like decentralization and security. One being like the core base layer of Celestia itself uh, and kind of measuring decentralization from Celestia and the data availability layer. And then another component would be the execution environments or the layer twos building on top of Celestia. Could you maybe dive a little bit deeper into each of those and how you think about it? You mean specifically the decentralization of each of those or the scalability of them? Uh, the decentralization. I, I want to get into scale too, but right now just kind of like articulating sure. the decentralization aspect because I do think... <laughs> it is important. Yeah, so I think, um, like as I as I mentioned before, um, like the question is like, what are we trying to achieve out of decentralization? Because like decentralization is not a goal in itself. It's like a it's like a tool to achieve a goal. And, like, what is that goal? That goal, to, in my view, is number one, um, censorship resistance, and number two, um, resistance against safety violations from the validator set or from the um, executors of a ch specific chain. So, so from the perspective of the data availability layer, what that looks like is um, going back to the two points I mentioned earlier, block production decentralization and block verification decentralization. From the perspective of the data availability layer, you need block production uh, decentralization to make sure that the DA layer is cens censorship resistant. So it's like not censoring specific roller blocks or censoring specific transactions. And, and these are that, full nodes, correct? Sorry? And these are full nodes? Um, these are like consensus participating full nodes. So these are like validators. Okay. Like you, need, okay. you need a distributed set of like validators. And ultimately to do that, you need a um, distributed set of like staking participants or like a distributed set of token holders that can delegate their stake. Um, but it's like it's a question is like um, the, the the goal in that in my, in my opinion is not to necessarily make it so that you have as many validators as possible because there's a, if you there's a trade off between having too many validators as part of the BFT protocol and having yeah. a slow BFT protocol with slow finality. Um, so the question is like what is like the what is a good threshold or minimum th what what is a good like Nakamoto like coefficient to have to achieve your base layer of censorship resistance. Like that's the first kind of element of decentralization. And as you know, like you we have use ten limit consensus, which um, you usually limit to like to two hundred to hundred or two hundred validators. Um, and then secondly, the other important element of decentralization is I mentioned as I mentioned is resistance against safety violations. And from the perspective of the data availability layer, a safety violation is if the validators um, try to withhold data or they try to commit to a block and without publishing the data behind that block and to kind of like prevent that we make it we we we, we, we focus on trust minimized light nodes that use data availability sampling to ensure um, that it's very cheap for end users to 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 verify that safety violations have not occurred on the chain so that's what it looks like from the DA layer. From the execution layer, the, sorry, go ahead. Maybe just uh, touching on the DA layer specifically, you mentioned like once you have like a sufficient or some threshold of full nodes on the base layer, 
uh, that will probably be sufficient. What do you think? I mean, it's, it's interesting now, just like kind of, there's so many people with so many different points of view. What do you think is like a good number to get to? Some people think it's like 10. Some people think it's a hundred. Some people think it's a thousand or 10,000. Um, how do you view it? I mean, it's really hard to, um, say, I don't know if you have enough data points about that. Cause like, you know, blockchains are only about like t- 10 years old. Um, but you know it's it, it's really hard to say. But um, as I, as I said before, no chain has no major chain has had like a Nakamoto coefficient of more like more than fifty or so. Yeah. Um, but even then, kind of like censorship attacks have been extremely rare, even with chains with low low Nakamoto coefficients. Like so, like for example, Bitcoin at certain points have has has an extremely low Nakamoto coefficient, where you only need to corrupt like four or five finding pools. To censor transactions, yeah. but even then, censorship hasn't occurred. Um, but I'm not going to say that 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 like four or five is good enough, because like we simply don't have enough data points. But you know, I would say like on the order of magnitude, um, it's also not just about not the, the the number of validators. It's also about making sure that they're kind of like um, geographically distributed among a sufficient number of jurisdictions, and also making sure that there's an underlying um, decentralized token holder base that can be delegate their stake to other validators if they try to censor. Um, but I would say, you know, like uh, on the order of, you know, like tens or hundreds of validators seems sufficient to me. Like once you get into the range of thousands of validators, you know, that are that have two thirds of stake, that seems to me like overkill um, kind of at this point of time. Because once you start to get into the range of thousands of validators, then you're really tra- starting to trade off um, the performance of the BFT protocol with a number of validators for potentially very yep. diminishing returns. Agreed. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I definitely think I, I, in full agreement with you. I think Nakamoto kind of coefficient and that real time censorship re- resistance is the thing to optimize for. And I think in some cases the industry is over optimized for a large number of full nodes at the cost of performance. And, uh, I think we, we both agree we need lots of performance, uh, to actually scale the networks. Um, and then I, I apologize. I cut you off, uh, about the execution environments, but how do you view those as well? And then I would love to jump into light clients because I, I really do think you guys have pushed this space forward on the light clients front and I want to give a good amount of time to talk about what all the work that you've done there. Yeah, sure. And I should just clarify on the last point. Um, when you mentioned full nodes, I'm specifically talking about um, consensus participating full nodes, like yep. the, the, the actual values. But in terms of like decentralization of the execution environment, we expect the developers to use rollups to develop execution environments. So the question is like, what does rollup decentralization look like? And like going back to the, the two points I mentioned, number one, um, decentralization of block verification to make sure that, that there's censorship resistance. And number two, decentralization of block verification to make sure that there's resistance against safety violations. Like what does that look like in a rollup? So first of all, let's talk about censorship resistance on the rollup. Now, the, ni- the interesting thing about rollup is that you can actually um, have a censorship resistant rollup even if that rollup has one block producer or like one sequencer. And so like for a rollup to achieve the end goal of censorship resistance, you don't necessarily need to have to, to, to have decentralization of block production, even though that helps. And the reason for that is, is that because, st- sorry. Sorry, sure. I, I was going to yeah. jump in, but uh, you beat me to the point. Yeah. So the reason for that is because rollups can inherit the consensus and the ordering of the underlying data availability layer that they post their data to. And one of the ways they can do that is like, let's assume that a rollup has a single sequencer and that single sequencer starts censoring transactions. Then what you can implement is a protocol where users can force the sequencer to include transactions by having some kind of like on-chain inbox on the DA layer that users can submit transactions to that inbox such that um, the next rollup block is only valid if the sequencer includes the transactions posted to that inbox. And for example, that's what Arbitrum does. 
And that's kind of like a very interesting and potentially powerful property of rollups. The idea that you don't need like this massive set of sequencers. You technically, you can achieve censorship resistance with only one sequencer. Um, that's, that's a significant reduction in like ha the, the hardware costs to operate a rollup chain. And secondly, um, the other you know, decentralization property which I mentioned, which is decentralization, decentralizing um, block verification. There's several ways that rollups can achieve this. Usually they achieve it through fraud proofs or ZK proofs. Like it, it, a user can run a, or a smart contract can run a light client um, that verifies fraud or ZK proofs of that rollup instead of having to download every transaction in that rollup and verify it. And usually that's needed for bridges between rollups and L1s or rollups and rollups. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. So uh, just to recap, uh, for less technical people, ultimately because the layer two settle to kind of a secure layer one, uh, it doesn't necessarily matter as much if there is a single sequencer because they can always kind of hit the eject button and go back to the layer one. Um, and then um, on the second point, of decentralization uh, with zero knowledge or optimistic, um, ultimately, or with the light clients, you can kind of subsample a small set of data, which ultimately allows you to do a small fraction of the work uh, compared to the large full nodes on the base layer. Correct? Yeah. Well, cool. for, what, by um, subsampling, you mean like four or ZK proofs, I guess. Correct, yeah. Yep. Okay, uh, cool. No, uh, makes a lot of sense and uh, appreciate uh, giving lots of clarity there. I always kind of <laughs> like to start there. But as I've said, like, I, I really do think you guys have pushed the space and you specifically have pushed the space forward on like clients and really opened the eyes of the industry, I think, to what are possible with them. Can you maybe just do a quick deep dive of what are like clients, why they're so important, and ultimately how they help scaling so much. Sure. So if anyone's ever used a like MetaMask wallet, which I'm sure most of you have, um, like you'll probably have heard that like, how does MetaMask interact with the Ethereum network? Your, your MetaMask wallet isn't connecting directly to the Ethereum network. Instead, it's using a kind of like trusted third party. And that's usually Infura or Alchemy. And that trusted third, your, your, that trusted third party you're relying on them to tell you the correct information about the state of the Ethereum chain. And you're also relying on them to relay your transactions. And to me, that's like very antithetical to what Web3 should be about. Um, in Web3, in my opinion, that the users should be first class citizens of the network because the whole point of Web3 is trust minimization. Like the whole thing that differentiates Web2 and Web3 is that in Web3, you're not interacting with this with a centralized database. You're interacting uh, with a decentralized network that, and you don't have to trust a uh, trusted third party to tell you what the correct state of that decentralized network is. But the problem is that um, typically, like traditionally, in order to interact with the chain and to know what the state of a chain is, to know what your balance is, to know what transactions have occurred, you would typically have to run what's called a full node. And a full node is basically a node that you know, downloads every single block in that chain and has to check every transaction is valid and read every transaction to check that the chain is correct and to tell you to, to, to verify um, information about what the state of that chain is and to get your balances and so on and so forth. But you also have something called um, a light client and a light client is, um, you know, exists in Bitcoin and Ethereum, but a traditional light client um, is kind of like a full node, except that it, it doesn't, verify every transaction in the chain. Instead, a light client only downloads what's called a block header. Like it only downloads the metadata or a small fraction of the data of every single block in that chain. And instead of verifying that every transaction is correct, instead it just assumes that every transaction is correct. And the reason why it can make that assumption is because it trusts that the validator set or the miners of that ch chain are honest. And um, that's inherently a weaker threat model than a full node. 
because full nodes don't trust the miners or validators of a chain. To be honest, they verify they verify for themselves. They don't trust. They verify, but light clients or traditional light clients don't do that. They just they just assume that the validators are honest, and so like if the validators like arbitrarily started changing the protocol rules of that chain, and um, like against everyone against everyone's wishes. Like let's say they wanted to print a bunch of more money, or they wanted to change the inflation schedule or something like that. They could do that without light clients noticing. And so that's why um, instead, of, instead of having traditional light clients, you can have what's called trust minimized light clients. And a trust minimized light client is kind of like halfway between a, um, a traditional light client and a full node. Um, a traditional light, a tradi a trust minimized light client is better than a traditional light client because it can use technologies like fraud or ZK proofs or data availability sampling to get very high assurances about the um, the correctness of every transaction in that chain without them having to manually download and check every transaction in that chain. So like trust minimized light clients, they have almost the same level of security guarantees as a full node, but with way less resource requirements. Yeah, no, it, it's super interesting. And I mean, again, like you, you and the team were pioneers in kind of uh, creating uh, these light clients. And I I think, I, I, I'm assuming now, uh, at least majority of teams that I talk to today uh, are going or at least attempting to implement uh, these trust minimized light clients in some form or fashion. And so uh, it has to feel uh, great to see your research uh, spread across the industry. On the, so maybe touching a little bit upon or if I could re-articulate it a little bit, these trust minimized light clients have fraud or validity proofs uh, where they're able to get higher assurances than just strictly a light client that only downloads the header information. Um, and because with a fraud or a zero knowledge proof, uh, these assurances are much higher than it would just be for the header specifically. But you also mentioned uh, data availability sampling and how the light clients themselves can do uh, data availability sampling. And I, I think that's an important element as well. Could you talk a little bit about data availability sampling and how that ties into these trust minimized light clients? Sure. So um, like having fraud or ZK proofs to verify the state of the chain, that's not sufficient to have a trust minimized light client. You also need to make sure that a light client can get assurances that all the data in the chain was actually published without them having to download that data themselves. And the reason why that's important is, as I mentioned, for fraud proofs, um, no one can generate a fraud proof if the data wasn't published. Like there's, if there's no evidence, if the evidence for the transactions weren't published, you can't generate, you can't prove that something bad happened. And for ZK proof is needed because, well, for ZK proof, data availability is needed because just because you can prove that the um, using ZK proofs that the next state commitment or the next state of the chain was valid, it might be the case that the sequencer of the next block has actually committed to a valid state, but they haven't actually published or told everyone what the actual transactions are that led to that state. So like people will know that this, the block is correct, but they don't know what's actually inside that block. And so they don't know what their balances are and they can't build on that block because they don't know how to build on it. And so that's why data availability is important for fraud or ZK rollups. But um, what data availability sampling allows is it allows light nodes to verify that all the data in that chain was published without having to download the data themselves to check that it was published. And the way that data availability sampling works is like in a very kind of like a layman's or, or, or nutshell way of explaining it is that you basically like sample random data or random chunks from that block. Um, and by sampling random chunks from that block, after a certain number of samples, you can get like an almost 100% guarantee that the entire block was published by only sampling, let's say like 1% or 2% of that block. 
Yeah, uh, no, it, it's it's super fascinating what data availability sampling ultimately allows you to do. Uh, having many of these light clients uh, download a particular subset of the data uh, to have these stronger guarantees, and ultimately, uh, with the end goal being these light clients almost being as strong in the security guarantees as the full nodes, uh, it, it is all fascinating. And how how long or how many years or what kind of like ultimately led you to this innovation that uh, you've studied so much on like the trust minimum is like clients? Yeah, I think like one of the kind of things that made me really interested in like clients is there was like this scaling debate in Bitcoin, you know, back from, back in 2013, 2016. Mm-hmm. Like there was a, like this was before Ethereum. There was a, there was a point in Bitcoin's history where, you know, for the first time ever, there was a one, one megabyte block size limit, and that was starting to get full. And this was like during like the bull market, if I of like 2013, if I remember correctly. But these blocks were starting to get full, and the transaction fees were starting to get really high. Like they were like fifty dollars a transaction, and that was causing um, kind of like this, this this crisis in Bitcoin, where merchants stopped accepting Bitcoin. So it was like the, the whole narrative around Bitcoin at that point was like it was supposed to be peer to peer cash. But it was like $50 a transaction and then merchants stopped accepting it because it was too expensive and no one, no one was using it for payments. And so there was this kind of like divide in the Bitcoin community where like a, a, um, a portion of the community wanted to increase the block size limit from one megabyte to something higher. Whereas the other portion of the Bitcoin community did not want to do that and they wanted to pursue scaling techniques like Lightning Network instead. And the reason why like that that portion of the Bitcoin network did not want to increase the block size limit is because they were concerned that if you increase the block size limit, that will increase the cost of running a full node. Like, it will become more and more expensive to run a full node. And if it becomes more and more expensive to run a full node, you will have to trust the miners more and more to not misbehave. And um, you know, Bitcoin has had a very contentious relationship with miners. Like, you know, there was the fact that only a few mining pools, you know, controlled a large chunk of the Bitcoin hash rate. You know, you really didn't want trust. You didn't want to trust the miners for safety. And so to me, like, well, I I was asking, well, how can we increase the block size without increasing the resource requirements for end users to verify the chain? And interestingly, um, in the Bitcoin paper itself, like Satoshi mentioned, uh, a very early idea, a very early idea, um, like a very early version of fraud proofs that he called alerts. And like alerts was this idea, like a, a full node could alert other nodes or other light clients that a certain block was invalid and force them to have to redownload that block um, to check that it was correct. Interesting. But that was like a very primitive version of fraud proofs that, w- that wasn't scalable or DOS resistance. And so... Um, then there was some like further innovation on this idea of compact fraud proofs, which are like fraud proofs that are small, but you can send them to a light node and they can easily verify them, um, even if they don't have high resource requirements. But at the time, um, like, like compact fraud proofs were a thing that the Bitcoin community was very interested in. But there was this data availability problem because compact fraud proofs can only work if you can have data availability proofs for light clients. And that was a much harder problem to solve than um, compact fraud proofs. And that's kind of like what led me down this, this rabbit hole of trying to figure out how to make trust minimized light nodes and make me realize that data availability is kind of like the core, one of the core um, like functions of Bitcoin, of, of, a, of a blockchain. Yeah, fascinating. That's a, that's a cool story. I... Yeah, it, it took me much probably longer to realize how important data availability was or just like kind of raw throughput of like these nodes and bandwidth constraints than you. And so I'm definitely envious of uh, your earlier learnings. Um, on, maybe on that topic specifically, um, I know you and I have kind of gone back and forth a little bit on Twitter on like throughput 
And John, I think, kind of comically said uh, Celestia's initial throughput was going to be like 1.4 megabytes. But uh, as you mentioned, it's kind of just like a parameter that's tunable. One thing that I've really tried to do uh, kind of as just like a more apples to apples comparison has been like evaluating these different blockchains by their uh, data availability layers um, just to have some like common ground. Well, I, I know Celestia is still kind of working towards mainnet and it is per- parameterized, but I guess maybe where do you believe like you're going to start? And then ultimately like, where do you think it's going to end up? Or is it just a number that's going to be ever increasing as kind of demand increases as well? Sure. So yeah, as I mentioned, um, it's important to realize there's a difference between throughput and scalability. Like throughput, you can just say throughput is how many transactions per second you can do, or like how many data per second you can make available. But scalability is throughput divided by the cost for end users to verify that chain. Like it's very easy yeah. in theory to increase throughput by just increasing the block size. Like th- you can say that Bitcoin is extremely scalable. All you have to do is increase the block size. But and you can increase the block size if you increase the requirements, the resource requirements for running a full node. And that's fine. But that's not the same thing as scaling. So and, and that's why um, we say in Celestia, Celestia scales with the number of light clients. Because the more light clients you have, the more light clients are sampling blocks. The the bigger the blocks you can securely have without violating this property of decentralizing block verification. So as I mentioned um, on Twitter, like ultimately, um, you know, block, like the, the block size is a governance parameter and the community has to kind of like make a decision about what is the maximum block size we can have without having a sufficient number of light clients. And after that, the community will probably only want to increase the block size after knowing that there's, there's a sufficient number of light nodes that are sampling the chain, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, it, it yeah. definitely does. I guess like on the base layer, uh, does that kind of grow linearly on uh, the amount of like bandwidth that is needed for the nodes and then as uh, it gets higher and higher, you add these trust minimized light clients and with more light clients coming online, each of them have to do a smaller fraction of the work, allowing you to scale the base layer even more. Um, so like we, our goal is like light nodes roughly have to do um, an equal amount of work, regardless of how the block size is, how big the block size is. So like increasing the block size um, like would just basically mean that we need to increase the number of light nodes. Uh, but that means that each light node will do roughly the same amount of work. But what that does also mean is that to increase the log size, we also have to increase the resource requirements for running a validator node. So like, let's say if it's 100 megabits and you want to increase it 10x, it needs to be now one gigabit, for example. Mm-hmm. But that's um, that's why that it kind of goes back into, into this idea of like block... Um, decentralization of block uh, production versus decentralization of block verification. And that's why um, we, we place a, heavy, a very heavy emphasis on decentralization of block verification. Because even if these validators have very high resource requirements, you don't have to trust them for safety because we have these trust, trust minimized light nodes. Yeah. No, it definitely makes sense to me. And I mean, on more layman's terms, ultimately, the more kind of trust minimized light clients that you add to the network, the more scalability or higher resource requirements you can have at the base layer because you're still, as in your words, getting that end user verification, which is ultimately kind of the kind of main premise of blockchains more holistically. Exactly. Yeah. Makes sense. Um, it, it was interesting. I was reading Vitalik's like blog posts. I, I forget what it was called, the end game. And he was kind of talking about Ethereum and Celestia and some of these more high throughput chains. And I think the key thing there, uh, I think you're actually, uh, I don't know either one of the co-authors, but I think definitely, uh, uh, cited on his work, uh, on light clients, but how 
all majority of these kind of blockchains will all end up in kind of a similar end state in the sense of the resources on the base layer continue to kind of increase and these trust minimize like clients ultimately allow these end user verification. If that world ultimately ends up happening, what do you think like are going to be like the main uh, kind of differentiators of different chains? Is it the execution environments? Is it how they do consensus? Um, I'm curious. Or it, and it, or if you don't believe that's like the end goal or end state, uh, please feel free to share anything else. Um, yeah, I mean it's, it's a good question. Um, like I do, I do think that's the end state, and and that's why I've mentioned I've been mentioning why block the centralization of block verification is extremely important. Because if we do end up in this end state where um, you have centralized block production, it then becomes extremely important to have decentralized block verification so that we don't have to trust decentralized block producers um, for safety. Like they can't still, they can't like arbitrarily change the rules of the chain and so on and so forth. But in terms of like what differentiates, what will, what will be the differentiator of different chains? Like I think like one of the things that we truly believe is, and one of the reasons why we believe in a modular ecosystem and we, you know, we have messages like um, we believe in modularism and not maximalism is because like, we don't really believe that there's ever going to be like a one size fits all solution. Like if you look, look at web two, does every website use the same, um, you know, hosting provider? Does every website use the same technology stack? Like, of course not. Like uh, different applications use different technology stacks. So I don't really believe in the idea of like having a single world computer or a single settlement layer. Um, it's not, it sounds nice in theory, but in practice, I don't think that's what the market wants. I think in, in practice, there's going to be like a range of, uh, there's going to be a stack and different components in that stack. It, it's going to be a modular stack where you can swap out different components. Um, depending on uh, what the application wants to maximize, maximize and what kind of trade-offs is trying to make. Because ultimately, different stacks have different trade-offs. Definitely. Do you think that will be like 5, 10, or like 100, 10,000? I guess going back similar to like question to the nodes. Um, you mean how many what? How many chains? Uh, well, I, I mean, whether it's like either different layer ones or either different layer twos on Celestia, do you, do you end up that being like consolidated into kind of relatively few players or kind of few core execution environments that kind of take majority of the market share? Or do you kind of envision it being thousands that are... Uh, doing slightly different things tailored for uh, specific applications. Well, I mean, actually, I actually see a potential future where there's millions of application-specific mm. roll-up chains. Like, I think that's that's a very uh, realistic future that we're heading. Um, like, if you look at the internet today, uh, yes, we have like these centralized Web two platforms, like you know, Facebook or Twitter, and so it's like for Web three. Do we believe, like, I think, like, for Web3, I feel like believing that, um, you know, everyone will use the same few L1s or, like, use the same few chains and not have these application-specific chains. It's kind of like believing, like, everyone will use these this same centralized platforms, like, you know, Twitter or Facebook. I think in practice, you are going to have, like, just like in Web2, you have, like, all these independent blogs, blog, blog, blog sites and all these independent, you know, shops using Shopify and so on and so forth. I think for Web3, that will be there will be more of that because the whole point of Web3 um, is that you have you have it's, it's more it's supposed to be more decentralized. So like I do see a future where there's millions of application specific rollup chains, um, that and many of them will have shared security. And like for example, like in the future, if you wanted to create a DAO or a you know a Dex or an F or a game or anything like that, why would you like you'll probably there's a strong chance that instead of deploying as a smart contract on a shared layer one smart contract platform, you could potentially deploy it as a um, as a rollup chain. And because like one of the goals of Celestia and a modular stack is to make the new, deploying new rollup chains as easy as deploying smart contracts. And like if you look at the evolution of the web, that's kind of like where we are today. Like no one these days use, uses a shared hosting provider like Bluehost or GeoCities or DreamHost. Instead, people use virtual machines. Like you can spin up a virtual machine in seconds and have 
have your own execution environment. So now, like the web now consists of like these millions or even billions of these virtual machines that all um, are all talking to each other. And I see rollups as being very similar or the same as virtual machines because rollups are effectively like virtual blockchains that use, a, use yeah. the same underlying sh shared security layer. Do you think ultimately kind of in that world of vision are these different execution environments or do you ultimately see, again, like a couple execution environments, whether that's parallelization, fuel, <laughs> SVM, uh, a move virtual machine or EVM virtual machine? Uh, or do you think people will kind of tailor the virtual seams? Um, like I think um, I think there will definitely be multiple dominant execution environments. Uh, like I don't see like one specific execution environment succeeding. Like I think the effects, I think like people saying like um, everyone will just use the EVM because that's that has the biggest developer base. I don't think that will actually pay out. Like if you look at Web two, there's like new programming languages, and um, like every five years, the entire like you know Web two stack, the most popular Web two stack frameworks are completely different. You know like GoLang yeah. didn't exist like a, a decade or two ago. Rust is now suddenly the new big thing and so on and so forth. Whereas like 15 years ago, it was Python. Like every five years, um, there's always new innovations in programming, language, programming languages and execution environments. Um, that it const it's, const it's constantly an evolving landscape. And I think that's one of the benefits of having a modular stack. Like you're not going to, and not having a, not coupling a smart contract environment with your layer one. Because, it's, because the, the, what's best is constantly evolving. So by having a modular stack, um, you can always you can easily very easily iterate on experimenting with new execution environments by having by deploying new rollups instead of having to deploy new layer one chains. Definitely, and, and that shared security definitely makes that a, a lot easier. And uh, yeah, definitely much easier to spin up a new virtual machine if something kind of comes uh, out with something super innovative innovative and uh it's much easier to adopt there than kind of rewrite your entire tech stack and have to change the virtual machine on um on kind of the millions of different um roll-ups how do you see compo composability kind of playing out in that like state do you are applications ultimately kind of sector specific you see like some very large uh roll-ups and liquidity is kind of um moved to that specific roll-up or do you feel like uh composability is not something super needed uh i'm curious in what you think how it will play out yeah i think composability and interoperability are definitely important um I, but i just don't see i, I just think it's very it's very unlikely uh, like i've that we will have like a single synchronous chain where every smart contract operates and have synchronous interoperability with every contract. Because we see in practice today, that if you look at the Web3 landscape today, there, there isn't a single synchronous chain that everyone uses and has smart contracts that interoperate with each other. Instead, you have like this, this um, cluster of different ecosystems with, with, with their own state machines. You know, like you, have, you have Ethereum, and then you have like Polygon, Solana, Avalanche, and so on and so forth, and you have bridges between them. And Ethereum has kind of like realized that, and now you have these roll-up chains um, that are effectively their own chains that have bridges between them. And the way that I kind of like, uh, you know, like think about bridges is I kind of categorize bridges into kind of trust minimized and trusted. And both types of bridges are okay, depending on your use case. Uh, but the way I see the kind of like ecosystem evolving um, is we have is by having these shared security zones or what I call clusters. Like you won't have you won't have you, you won't gonna have like the same secure one secu one big shared security zone. We'll have like multiple shared security zones. And what I'm meaning by that is, like, if you look at like for example like Ethereum, you can classify Ethereum and all of its rollups as one shared security zone, in the sense like all the rollups on Ethereum can interoperate with each other. Um, in a trust minimized way by sharing security. And then like if you want to exit Ethereum and go to Polygon, you have to use a trusted bridge and you have to like go across these shared security boundaries. And I think that's okay. And, I, 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 and that's how I see Web3 evolving. We will have shared security zones that interoperate with each other and assets will be flowing across these shared security boundaries. 
But it's important to have these shared security zones in the first place. Because we don't want to end up in a world where if you have millions of chains, each each chain has is in their own shared security zone because that's not shared security anymore in the first place. Yeah, and that's kind of like your main <laughs> issue with Cosmos and kind of the Avalanche ecosystem. Yeah, for sure. Makes sense. Um, and then in that kind of, I mean, shared security world, it definitely helps with the asynchronous composability but with like um, synchronous composability, do you think, again, like some apps will co-locate or I'm curious, uh, just kind of like nailing you down on some of your thoughts on the composability aspects? Well, you also have synchronous composability like within rollups, for example, or like across, yeah. or potentially even across rollups if, if there's rollups share the same aggregator. So there's been some interesting discussions recently um, about roll, about having you know synchronous composability across rollups, and that's possible if those rollups ha- have a shared aggregator, and that shared aggregator could actually be a decentralized um, aggregator network as well. Would but that the be a layer like, three? Sorry. Would that be a layer three? Well. Well, this, this idea of layering starts to become a bit fuzzy at that point. It's not really clear, <laughs> yeah. like layer three or layer two point five or two point one okay. at that point. But it's like a it's like a um, shared aggregator network. Okay. Um. But yeah, I mean, I, I think the question is like, is it realistic to assume that in the future, the, like, is it realistic to build towards a world where every Web three application has synchronous composability? No. Uh, in my opinion, no, and um, like we will we will have syn- synchronous composability zones, but between those zones, you will have asynchronous composability, and that's like that is, to me, in my view, that's clearly what the market wants. Like, we, like that's how that's the market today. Like the, the Web three ecosystem as a whole has asynchronous composability, and within s- specific chains or specific rollup chains, you have synchronous composability. Yeah. No, it, uh, your vision definitely makes sense. I'm I'm super curious to see uh, ultimately where long term long term things kind of end up, and I appreciate the different chains trying different things. Uh, I uh, it's a very deep rabbit hole, and I, I think you've obviously spent a lot of time and uh, thinking about it. And the the market is. <laughs> I mean, right now the bear market is probably my favorite just because we c- can kind of do some of more these long forward conversations and it's less marketing and PR, uh, but lots of furious battles being fought on Twitter at the moment. Um, in terms of like these different virtual machines, we kind of touched upon it. Do you see like any like, I mean, in my mind, I kind of think of like two v- main buckets of virtual machines one being like the parallel execution and one being the serial threaded or um is that how you think about them or as well and if so where do you think like those ultimately progress long term yeah i mean i definitely think like parallel execution environments definitely um have a lot of advantages over execution environments that don't have parallelization like i think there's just like a it's just objective. Technically speaking, it's like objectively better. Um, like I don't see any advantages of having a non-parallelizable execution environment, and that's like I guess like what that's one of the advantages of the EVM, and that's why innovating on new execution environments enabled by a modular stack, where people can innovate without having to launch a new layer one, is very important. Do you think? I mean, that majority of virtual machines kind of going forward or outside of the Ethereum virtual machine will be paralyzable long-term? That definitely seems to be kind of where it's heading. Um, yeah. Like all the new execution environments, like, you know, like uh, Move and Sui and Fuel um, are all paralyzed. Yeah. No, I I definitely agree. I, yeah, they, they definitely make a lot more sense. <laughs> I, I yeah. definitely applaud Ethereum for... I mean, the invention of smart contracts and kind of pushing uh, forward from Bitcoin, uh, massive undertaking in that. And I think uh, we've learned a lot since 
Ethereum and what the Ethereum researchers have ultimately put out and kind of now the next step of virtual machines is definitely parallelization. So uh, no, super interesting. I guess like maybe kind of wrapping up the podcast, uh, when mainnet? So we're planning, so we released incentivized testnet and we're very close to mainnet. It's planned for Q2 or Q3. Awesome. Wonderful. Uh, I know a lot of people have been super excited about it. Uh, and I wish you the best success on uh, the test nets. Thank you. And if, everyone, if anyone wants to run a node, um, you can go on our docs at slidesh.org. And you can kind of like go there and run a trust minimized that client and to see what it's like. Oh, yeah. That's awesome. Uh, I, and maybe last thing. Um, I think now that there is a multiple kind of layer twos, there's multiple different layer ones, there's avalanche subnets, there's cosmos zones, all these different <laughs> ecosystems to build upon. What would your pitch be to the engineers or builders watching this podcast to build on top of Celestia in an L2 or uh, just contribute to the Celestia ecosystem? So I guess my pitch would be, um, and my pitch wouldn't be about building on Celestia specifically, it will be building in the modular ecosystem. And like Celestia is just one stack in that ecosystem. But my, my pitch would be um, like over the past, you know, 10 years, we've been stuck in this endless loop of new layer ones. Like we have every bull market, we have this new cycle of new layer ones. And then they, you know, they get filled up and then they don't scale or they fail to get traction. And then the next cycle, we have these new layer ones that promise incremental improvements. And clearly that's not sustainable. Um, like, do we, do, do, we, do we really want to live in a world where every cycle we have these new layer ones and then you redeploy these layer ones? I would say like, that's, that's very restricting for developers. Um, like, and if you want to be, if you want to have more freedom, you know, build on a modular stack. Like build a roll-up chain on, on on the modular stack and use whatever execution environment you want. Like build whatever you want instead of having to be restricted to specific layer one ecosystems. Yeah, I'm personally very much looking forward to all the different kind of engineering point of views that bring in more users and more developers. And so, uh, if engineers can experiment and uh, on Celestia and different virtual machines and users love it. I'm, I'm all for it. And, uh, but definitely really appreciate your time, Mustafa. Uh, I, I think on Twitter, it's easy to kind of go back and forth and throw haymakers, but, uh, it's fun to get into the long form kind of nitty gritty of things. Uh, last, last thing, w w I mean, besides Celestia itself, are there any specific things that you're excited for, for the rest of kind of 2023, um, that you're looking forward to or you just think are interesting to kind of follow along with? Yeah, I think um, like one of the de things I'm definitely kind of watching or looking out for in this year um, is this emergence of roll-up as a service providers. This idea that you can create your own chain, you can upload the code to some roll-up as a service provider, and within seconds, that roll-up as a service provider will automatically deploy as a roll-up on some DA layer and run the first sequencer for you. And you don't have to trust that you don't have to trust that service at all because the roll-up is trust minimized and inherits censorship resistance on the base layer and has fraud and decay proofs. And I'm gonna be it's gonna be very interesting to see um like what the world looks like after that in a world where deploying a new chain in a decentralized way truly becomes as easy as deploying a new smart contract. So developers will no longer be limited to the kind of like restrictions of smart contract platforms. They can now just deploy a new chain as easy as deploying a um, new smart contract. And that's definitely one of the things that I'm kind of like looking to see how that evolves. Definitely. Uh, hopefully lots of innovations to uh, get spurred out of that. So uh, again, thank you so much, Mustafa. I appreciate your time. Appreciate you coming on the podcast. Uh, appreciate you pushing the space forward. Uh, appreciate all the research you've done on light clients and uh, look forward to uh, seeing what you and the Celestia team continue to build. Thanks. It's been fun. Awesome. Thank you.